Hello, welcome to Whispers in the Theater. I'm your host, the Whispering God Nishu, here once again to continue our exciting tale. The Other Side of Myth, Chapter 5. The Girl with the Magic Stone. The rest of the weekend went to Dortessa's words. Rather than the shadow of the city, Kiara spent her time there. She knew that a feline would attack. No question could be levied. No doubt could be made. Feline would attack. So all that mattered was the wind. Wind would be best. It took little pondering to figure out. The woman was clear in her desire. Kiara's friends would suffer. Kiara would helplessly watch. It said at once that she commit a crime and had no fear of retribution. Feline would cross a line with a roar. The thought of looking back didn't speak to cat. She'd make her move in one grand motion. It was only when Kiara's friends were gathered that the curtain would finally raise. The hours ticked down till the next day of school. Kiara felt it in her chest. That was when the woman would strike. Fully aware and in front of a mirror, she gave herself a long look. Chestnut skin and scarlet eyes stared back. They had no question, nor confusion, reflecting what she didn't have to say. This moment would change her world, and she couldn't press reset. The eyes fell to her pendant. The eyes fell to her pendant, bidding her hands to take hold. Worlds changed all the time. This pendant was a sign of that. Her parents gave it to her after an incident when she was small. Her cousin taught her to hold it dear. Gripped in gold sat a sparkling ruby, looped around her neck with gilded string. It was the only way she knew to wield her powers. It was a gift and a weapon, one she planned to use. Her friends greeted her when she got to school. Dark corners staying silent, nothing lurking inside. No silhouette filled the halls around turns. No phantoms lingered in long gazes of classroom. It was a normal day, despite the weekend's proceedings. It stayed that way even at lunch, where Taylor reminded her weekends could be plain. They gathered together, hearing the tale, all oblivious except the scarlet-eyed girl. As you all know, my mom was a bitch of a publicist. She was excited her daughter cornered the speckled beast. Taylor rolled her eyes. She made it clear the day after the encounter that she knew Kiara did the work. The credit would be hers to take, if Taylor knew how to prove it. She didn't have a clue where to start, but the case was on pause rather than drop. I was on three different shows talking about how amazing my Calayan bow training had been. I even told them about how I went to Calaya last month. She smiled, and Shin smiled too. One of my net friends linked me a video. He laughed. When they asked you what you did in Calaya, you gave them a name and was like, I did him. He did me. We both had a lot of fun. He chortled. Taylor smirked. What? Did they expect me to talk about calling tours? Wildlife grew fast in Kalea, and the only natural predator was the people living there. Besides, that's more fun. Imagine a Kalean hunter pressed against you. Their bodies are like sculptures. She bit her lip. The image in their minds made Kiara and Tristan trade looks. 
They pretended they hadn't a second later. But Shin and Taylor stared wide-eyed. Did... Did you two have sex? Shin nearly jumped, and Tristan's face flushed hard. No. Taylor examined Kiara. They haven't yet, but they're definitely thinking about it. She pointed, and Kiara shook her head. I haven't thought about that at all. She shrieked as Tristan swallowed. Rather than deny, he averted his eyes. Her face lit up, and she did the same. So, Taylor grinned. Does that mean you two are a couple now? She traced a circle on the cafeteria table, and the two shook their heads. We haven't even thought about that, Tristan said. Yeah, it was just a kiss, Kiara said, and Shin went through his pockets. He pulled out a thin packet, placing it in Tristan's hand. It's for when you do have sex. You put the gel around your... I know how to use it. Tristan jumped. His hand seemed to waver between Shin and his pocket. When he noticed Kiara looking, he handed it back. Shin's eyes lit up as he put it away. Don't worry, I got you, Trist. He grinned, and Kiara let out a mortified sigh. Whose house would you two go to anyway? Tristan had a little sister, but Kiara had a little brother. I don't think Kiara's parents would mind Tris coming over, but there's no way they let you two be alone for too long. Taylor tapped her cheek. Shin nodded. Tris's mom wouldn't let it happen either. You know how she is about Tristan getting into a good school. She'd say something like, Tristan, how are you supposed to study if you have a baby crying in your ear? You're supposed to be smarter than this young man. And hate Kiara forever. He was right but didn't have to say it. They didn't want this conversation, or Taylor nodding along. Can't come to my house. My mom would never let it happen. She'll think I corrupted you, Kiara. She added. Come to mine, she clapped. My parents work late. I'll let you guys have my room and go out to the store or something. You'll be done way before I get back. Unless you do it again. He paused. Tristan. How long does it take for you to recover? You have to know these things. Letting out a mortified sigh again, Kiara looked between Shin and Taylor and groaned. You two aren't going to let this go, are you? They shook their heads. Gotta make sure it's special for you guys. Shin nodded solemnly. He's right. Tristan, let Kiara have control. Once you two get a rhythm, you can try new things. Taylor nodded. Don't try anything fancy for the first few goals, either. You gotta be familiar with each other first. Shin spoke again. And for the rest of lunch, the two went over all the things they thought Kiara and Tristan should know. Kiara let out a freeing sigh when the bell rang. Trying to erase new images, she headed to class, her face still red. Before she could open the door, The intercom called for her attention. Her destination changed to the office instead, her feelings changing too, from embarrassment to exhaustion. They followed the script, prepared for the worst that Blight would have. Inside, he met her with a smile on his face, bidding her sit down. Miss Million, your encounter with the wild animal has drawn someone's attention. She would love a chance to talk to you and your friends about what happened. I think it would be a valuable opportunity. The kindness in his smile unnerved her. Almost as much as seeing Feline emerge from his office. Her dress was casual, stylish, a sleeveless white button-up and blue capris. An ankle bracelet shimmered around her right leg drawing attention to pedicured feet and tan sandals. In other eyes, she would look like a normal woman, but scarlet eyes looked would barely contain rage. Who is she? She whispered a growl. 
Mr. Blight smiled. His lips pursed as if to reply, but a name wasn't ready on his tongue. Alaco Bates, I'm a representative, you see. She flashed the card over her mobile, and Shooting Star Studio flashed on the display. I represent persons interested in making your encounter with the beast a movie. Taylor Baden is the hero for the media. But the way I hear it, you were the only one standing when the respondents arrived. The woman raised an eyebrow. Her eyes were blue. Something about that color seemed off. As I said, Miss Million, I think it will be a great opportunity for you. Why don't you go and round up your friends as you give her the story? Kiara turned a sneer on Blight. It made too much sense he had a role to play. He'd probably feign innocence if someone got hurt. Just an unlucky principal, blind to a con. She had a few words that'd get her in trouble again, but spared the man as the thought filled her mind. She nodded instead, begging the woman to follow her outside. When they were far enough away, she swallowed those words and spoke. How did you know where my score was? Well, even if the news hadn't been talking about the archer hero of Westwick High, the uniform was a dead giveaway. There aren't any other schools in Iravel that go for burnt orange and black. Feline tapped her head in response. Right. She has her beast memories. Kiara let the silence sit from there going over plans as she led the woman on. Down the hall, take a right, then left. The gymnasium sign spread out above her head, her ears attentive for sounds inside. Nothing. Maybe the class was in the field. She pushed through the doors, stopping in the middle of the court. The sandals were soft on the floor behind her, Telling of feline's approach. When they stopped, Kiara turned to face her. Hmm. I actually figured that one of your little friends were playing outside. Feline crossed her arms. Let me guess. This is your final stand. You're going to stop me before I go after them. Her eyes flashed gold. Kiara grabbed her pendant. I won't let you or your monster hurt anyone else. She held it tight. A light breeze filled the room. Oh, how precious. You think you have a choice. The woman sneered. The breeze crashed into her. It hit like a speeding truck. Off her feet and against the wall, she felt stone crack beneath her. The wind stopped. She stumbled forward, only to be smashed again. Kiara pushed, striking like giants, each breathe a pain, crushing a bug. The feline did not break. A ghastly aura emanated off her, growing denser as she fought back. Kiara pulled instead. Feline left the ground. Kiara looped her around the room, tearing folded bleachers from the wall. The debris piled in the corner with the woman. Scarlet eyes watched it closely, wind moving as splinters stirred. Feline stopped the push with an outstretched hand. Debris scattered as the wind broke, but she stood her ground. Her aura coalesced. It wrapped like film around her body, sealing its shape in hexagonal scales. It formed at last living armor, breathing, white, glowing with blue spots. Kiara moved to strike again, and Feline moved in half blinks. Kiara didn't see it when the knee hit her chest. She felt it first, quaking out breath fleeing the impact. 
This blow didn't just land against her body. It hit her soul, rippling through on the electricity of her nerves. It took her a moment to realize her body was falling back. She turned it to her advantage, using the fall to dodge flying claws. They still caught her cheek, static knives tearing the skin. Pain soared on echoes, racing up the side of her face. Eyes watering as feline moved again, Kiara pushed out. A blast of wind hit the woman, throwing her through the air. She landed on her hands and feet, power crackling as she lowered her stance. She took off, and Kiara used both hands, whipping up a cyclone. Not even the debris could escape her pool. It churned and crashed, violently shattering into pieces. It spoke to Kiara, making her whip faster. The gale struck feline with meteors of rubble. Kiara drove it more, a plan so certain it came to her lips. You will break! She didn't know she said it. Feline smiled as she read her lips. Two fingers came up. She mind pulling the trigger. A blast tossed Kiara across the room. No, you will, she said when wind stopped. The girl looked up, eyes ignited and determined. Feline followed her gaze. Rubble rained in a sudden cascade. The woman fell beneath it. A crash so loud the whole school shook. Kiara wobbled to her feet as it all lay still. Suddenly, wood flew. A claw tore across her stomach. She felt the pain from her head to her feet. She thought she screamed, but it hurt too loud to hear. The claws moved on, up her chest, across. Tears demanded a place in her eyes as the next claws primed for her neck. They stopped, feline's eyes drawn behind her. The girl hit the ground, and the woman walked on, giddy for whatever she saw. I'm certain I told you your trick wouldn't work. She almost strutted to her destination. If the police hadn't come... You would have never beat my pet. Kiara tried to follow, not with her eyes, but with her mind. The gym's geography came to her, but not before the woman reached her goal. Fire alarms filled the air. The room somehow grew colder as Kiara quickly caught on. Come one, come all to the front of the school. It's time Ala Cobate makes her debut. The woman posed, and all was clear. That would be the stage. In front of the school, the world would watch this woman prove she feared nothing. Horror would only certify her place. She would do it, surviving the police and anything that came after her. Vano, Kalea, Arla. This was just her first step to conquering the world. Fire alarms were telling. They forewarned disaster and the flames. I won't. Kiara breathed, pushing up. I won't let you. With gritted teeth, she rose to her feet. Feline spat a bitter laugh. What exactly can you do to stop me? Kiara listened to the ringing in the air. The noise was fitting. Her hand wrapped around her pendant. What can she do? Daughters told her the day before. Stop hesitating. Her eyes glowed, and Feline felt the air get lighter. Lighter first. 
then warmer, sweat flowing down her face. Too hot. She yelped as something stung her arm. Her eyes fell to it. Flesh was visible in a ring of ash. Her armor was burning away. Looking back, her eyes went wide. Kiara's left arm was outstretched, palm dripping with liquid scarlet flame. Distantly, Feline heard the doors open. It was the last thing she heard before the roar of fire swallowed her. The living armor ignited quickly. Pieces burned away, letting fire lick skin. She welled to the ceiling, and the room went still. The flame subsided, leaving felines smoldering for glowing scarlet eyes to take in. Don't ever threaten anyone I love again, Kiara growled. Feline could only whimper. Kiara? Tristan's voice came behind her. When did he come into the room? Miss Million! Blight hollered. Him too? His horror fought with indignation. Horror won as others joined in. All of them took second, however, to the look on Tristan's face. Taylor and Shin pushed to the front of the pack, but their eyes said no batter. What did she do? A teacher cried out. How the hell did she do it? A student shrieked. Sounds evolved into a mess of speculation. Kiara still watched her friend, scarlet eyes hoping for understanding. Please, please understand. The room went quiet as Emily raised a finger. I knew he... The words took the two girls back seven years. I... you... you really are one, aren't you? You're a wicked child. She cried. You really did it. My sister was right. Kiara didn't like this. She couldn't stop Emily but wish she could. You killed all those people. The girl wept, and no plea could be made. Kiara watched dread settle in her friends. She sent doors flying open, turning away from the looks of terror and mounting fear, dashing through them as her friends called after. She ran, their doubts on her trail, pain telling her there was nowhere to go. She couldn't fought her friends, or even Emily. How could you respond positively to someone burning alive? How could they see her the same way again, especially after what Emily said? Have you seen the girl with scarlet eyes? You have now. She couldn't be their friends, couldn't be a student. As she ran on, she realized she couldn't even go home. She didn't know where her body was taking her, but when she collapsed, she knew she was there. All of her scars were alive with agony. They electrified every nerve. Even if she wanted to stand, they wouldn't allow it. Was this what it felt like to die? As she lay in the dirt, she came to peace with it. She recognized her grave, after all. The same kindred iron skeleton where she fought the speckled beast. She was close to home, so maybe her parents would find her soon. Tears filled her eyes. The tragedy of that thought hurt more than her wounds. Her vision faded, however. She didn't have long to cry. As the final moments crept ever closer, Blue robes filled her vision. Their owner knelt, and with cloth wrapped around his eyes, Kiara knew exactly who he was. Daltis, she panted, and the man frowned. You hesitated. 
His voice quivered. Hey. She wanted to say she didn't. She wanted to say she did everything she could. But the words didn't come to her. She wondered if it was because she was dying or because it wasn't true. Regardless, daughter spoke. It is not yet your time to die. You are necessary. Your magic shall be the key to a great many things. He held out his hand, and Kiara felt her body leave the ground. Realizing he was helping her, she sucked in a breath. I can't go back. She huffed and took in another. I can't go back. Her friends, Emily's accusation, everyone's fear. She couldn't see that again. Then where to? She thought about her family and knew she couldn't go to them either. Even if they let her in, their lives would upheave. Somewhere where they won't be afraid. An image was in her head of a warmer place and a different time. There was a smell of fruit and flowers and a picture of a barely remembered face. She held on to the image. It was more solid than her sight. Unable to understand, Daltus simply shook his head. In a place where people aren't afraid of you, aren't you afraid of what they do fear? He said, and knew she couldn't respond. It does not matter. If you want to see this place, then so be it. I will show you a new world. A light wrapped around Kiara. With a gesture of his hand, she became a star shooting through the sky. Chapter 5 Ends And so too ends the first arc of The Other Side of Myth, as well as another episode of Whispers in the Theater. I hope the journey has been fun so far. It is sure to get more exciting from here. Until next time, I bid you adieu, and would be delighted if you were to join me once again.